Thank you. Uh, hello everyone, thank you for coming to this talk. Um, I'm Apurva. I'm going to be talking about like why physical storage of your database tables might matter. Um, a little bit about me. Okay. Okay. Okay, it's a little. Uh, so I work as a data platform engineer at Grofers. Uh, Grofers, as some of you might know, it's an online grocery company. Uh, we deal in providing uh, affordable groceries to the people at uh, the maximum, at, at the best prices and at best quality. Uh, one of our, uh, one of the ways that we do it is also in providing great customer experience and reducing uh, cost in our supply chain so that we can uh, deliver that value to our customers in terms of affordable prices. Coming back to the talk, uh, yeah. so uh, this talk is about a time when uh, like we were, de we were building our recommendation systems and we, uh, we realized that uh, a query is running very slow in our systems and th thus the entire API was timing out. Uh, so th the main idea behind this talk is like why as an application developer should you really care about the internals of your database, right? So as an application developer, uh, usually like with modern DB engines, we are usually dealing with the uh, SQL queries or the database abstraction which uh, Postgres or MySQL provides. But there are some times where you might have also have to deal with the internals. So we will, I will also be talking about that time. So starting with the talk. So like all great stories, this also, this uh, also starts with that it was a great dark and stormy night. Yeah. So uh, the new shiny recommendation system that we had built, uh, it was constantly timing out. It was constantly timing out, and the data engineers there uh, were trying to figure out at what is actually wrong with the system. So uh, the, just to give you a bird's eye view of what was happening, uh, we had a Flask-based application which was talking to my database, which was Postgres, through a SQL Alchemy-based ORM. And uh, we realized that when we looked at the breakdown of my API runtimes, we realized that the bottleneck was the SQL query which was running on the database. So uh, next, we looked at like what was uh, what was the cause behind that query running so slow. So like if you're an application developer and you have to deal with Postgres, then your best friend is explain analyze. Explain analyze gives you that flexibility of uh, looking at what the DB engine is actually doing behind the scenes. So we had this table called personalized recommendations, and the queries that the, the recommendation system was running on this database were like select star from this table where customer ID is so and so. Uh, this is a simple query, no complex joins happening, just a simple database lookup. Um, and as you can look at the structure for that table, uh, we already had an index on customer ID on this table. So uh, all that is needed for this query to perform better is already there. So what is it uh, that is not really uh, making the query fast? So as I said, like your best friend is explain analyze. Uh, we ran explain analyze on this particular uh, query and you can see that the index scan is already happening. The, the database engine, the query planner is al already taking into, into account the index scan and still the execution time is of the order of 110 ms. So uh, you might ask like is 110 ms that bad? Uh, given the fact that we want uh, most of our APIs to be under 100 ms, 110 ms for a simple database lookup is huge. Uh, so what are, the, what are the next steps that we can do to reduce this particular expensive query? Uh, so we realized that uh, in spite of the index scan happening at this point, we needed to understand what the index scan is really doing. Right, right. As application developers, you create an index and your, uh, the database takes care of the rest of the things. So you don't really go into details of what that index scan is doing. But this situation led us to uh, figuring out, okay, let me figure out what the database is really doing. So in Postgres, your default index is a B tree, a B tree or a balance tree of your default index entries. Uh, so in our case, it is going to be the customer IDs and and on the leaf nodes, you have those index entries itself. Like for example, uh, in our case, customer IDs, you have all these 39, 83, 98. These are all customer IDs. And on the leaf nodes, you have the, uh, you, uh, you have the records in which uh, the physical location or the, uh, the, the location for that particular record on the table is stored. Right? So example, uh, if you have to look at 57, uh, like customer ID 57, the, uh, the database will traverse through this particular B tree 
land up at 57, uh, it will look at okay, 57 has two different entries and uh, uh, these two different entries are your two different records for the table that match a particular uh, index and uh, B1, C1, 50 and 29, these are your uh, particular locations on the disk where this particular record is stored. So this, uh, the entire thing involves three steps. First is your tree traversal. Second is following the leaf node chain to figure, to get the B1, C1 and 5029 records. Third is actually fetching that table data. So the database also has to go to the location where B1, C1 is and fetch the record from that position. So these are the three steps involved. In the first step, you can see that it's, uh, it is upper bounded by order of log of n, where n is your total number of entries in your table. Third, second step is following the leaf node chain. Uh, this leaf node chain process can be as huge as your in entire index scan or the entire table scan. Because like if, for example, your table has just one customer ID uh, data, so then in that case, your index, your leaf node chain uh, has only uh, records for that particular table, for that particular customer ID. In our case, like we had a maximum of 200 records for a particular customer. So this step is also upper bounded by that. The third step is uh, where it is actually fetching the table data is where your random access IOs are actually happening. This is where the database engine is actually going onto the disk, uh, going onto that particular location from the, on the disk and fetching that record. So when we had to analyze, okay, where can that bottleneck of latency could be? The third is where, uh, we focus the most on. We realized that, okay, since my first two are still upper bounded, my third is what can usually, what, what can actually be the bottleneck. Uh, so we thought that it might be worthwhile to look at what is the distribution of that data onto the disk, which, uh, which the DB engine is actually doing. So uh, the post, Postgres uh, exposes something known as CTID. CTID uh, is a tuple. It's, a, it's an identifier, it's a double identifier in which your first element is actually the block number at which this particular record is stored. And the second element is the, uh, index, on, uh, is, the, uh, is the index on the block on which your particular record is stored. For example, for like the first uh, record that you see, 3789 is the block number and 28 is the position within that block where that particular index, where that particular record is stored. So as you can look at the distribution for a particular customer ID like 1254, you can see that all the records are spread across different blocks, right? And uh, within the, those different blocks, uh, 2873 are the positions of that particular data. So this means that uh, if the database was performing the third step of actually getting onto the disk, it is actually traversing all of these different blocks. And this can lead to a huge IO or the wait event IO. Uh, and that can increase my latencies. Uh, so we wanted to test this hypothesis if this is what is actually happening, right? Uh, so we thought that, okay, if what if I can cluster all of my data onto one block, can that improve my latencies, right? So, um, so uh, Postgres uh, specifies something known as a cluster command, which actually physically rearranges all the rows on your disk onto a, a given column. So if you say like I want to physically uh, co-locate all the rows for a particular customer ID, this cluster command can give you that flexibility. But there were some cons to using it. For example, it required that I acquire a read-write lock on the table, uh, which was not possible since my application was using it. And it also required me having a 2.5x the table size uh, for its operations. That was still not a concern as the disk space is still cheap. But like why have 2.5x the table size when uh, most of the time it is going to be idle? So these were some of the things that we uh, thought about uh, that were the cons of against using this particular cluster command also. Uh, so the next uh, steps that we took to fix it was can I uh, write my data in a particular format? For example, the application which is actually writing that data, can I, uh, when, can I ask that application to align my data in the way I want? Can I tell it uh, okay, hey, um, this particular customer ID has these many rows, why don't you write it into one block? Can I do that? So we went a little back from Postgres and uh, we had a Spark application which was writing all of this data. We had a simple Spark based ML jobs which was a simple collaborative filtering application and it, had, it uses a JDBC connector to write that data frame into Postgres. Uh, so this led us to understand, okay, can I uh, ask Spark to write in the manner that I want? Okay, so, okay. 
uh, so Spark uses the concept of partitions on RDDs. RDDs are resilient distributed data sets. Um, for Spark, that is the, uh, the most granular level of data that it operates upon. Uh, it partitions the data into your RDD. For example, let's take an example where you have to calculate the number of words in a particular text file. So what it will do, it will load that particular text file into a particular RDD and it will partition that data. You can specify the partition key also or it does it randomly. Uh, and say suppose you have a three cluster node for Spark, uh, it will have three workers assigned on each of the, of, of the node and each worker node will have uh, several executors working on it and each executor will have several RDDs assigned to it on which it will performing all your operations. So uh, you can see that each partition on the RDD is assigned to each of the workers. In this case, two, four and five are on one node. Similarly, one and three are on second node and three and six are on uh, the third node. So if a particular application like uh, summing, uh, uh, looking at the count of words uh, is happening in a text file, it will first I'll do a local sum uh, partition wise and say, okay, uh, coming back to the text file, say, okay, uh, what is the count of tiger, dog, pig, and elephant in each of the partitions? And at the very end, it will uh, basically ask, okay, uh, first partition has two count of tiger, third partition has five count of tiger, and uh, ultimately it will do a global sum and return you the results. It's a typical map reduce operation which happens. Uh, so you realize that, uh, okay, Spark is doing everything partition wise. What if it is also writing the data partition wise? Uh, if my entire uh, customer data and if my entire uh, customer and product data is partitioned according to various keys, is it doing, is it writing that data partition wise? To test that hypothesis, uh, we looked at the, uh, uh, what is my partition keys for my particular data frame. In this case, we realized that for, for like speeding up a particular operation, we had partition on product ID key. So all the rows for a particular product ID are at one partition. So product ID here means the recommended product that I am recommending to my particular customer. So for like 56th is 56 product ID is, uh, is the recommended product for so and so customers. Similarly, 656 and 860. Uh, so this means that if I had to confirm my hypothesis, okay, if Spark is doing uh, all the operations partition wise, this means that the data on my disk in my Postgres has to be pivoted or has to be uh, pivoted on custom on product ID itself. Like all the rows for a particular product ID might be clubbed together if my hypothesis of it writing partition wise is true, right? So we looked at the uh, distribution. We tested our hypothesis. Again, we went to CTID and say, okay, okay, hey, my product ID is this much. Now tell me what is the distribution? And yes, like uh, all the rows for a particular product ID are in one block itself. Like they are written almost contiguously in this particular block, which means that uh, all of my, like if I ran a query on product and like where clause of product ID, it should do, be doing a index scan, but the query should be much, much faster in that case. So we attempted to align the data. We said, Ki, okay, uh, my uh, data is right now aligned to product ID. What if I align it to customer ID? So we went back to uh, Spark and said, okay, uh, part repartition on customer ID. So Spark uh, exposes an API called repartition, uh, which, and whatever key that you specify it, it uh, aligns your data, uh, realigns the data on to that particular key. For, for in our case, it was customer ID. So the new data distribution, so we repartition on customer ID and did uh, write the data to back to Postgres and again check for distribution for customer ID two four. Uh, 28460, but no, the, the, the data is still not aligned, right? You can still see that for 28460, all of my rows are at different blocks still. So like, what is it that we did wrong? Because with product ID, this worked. Why is it that it will not work for customer ID? Uh, so we took a step back. We kind of thought about it. Uh, we went deep in thought and uh, figured out, okay, what is it that we're doing wrong? Uh, so we understood repartitioning. Like uh, uh, from what our understanding of repartitioning is, this is definitely not not what, not what is happening. Um, so we visualize the data frame. Okay, this is what is happening. Uh, this is where my data for the entire customer ID and product ID is happening. Mm, one second. Okay. So we realize that in that particular data frame, uh, in a particular partition, you had rows for more than one customer. 
right? So the default partition for a particular Spark uh, is 200 for a particular RDD. And we had about like 50 million customers in our case. So if you divide 50 million by 200, you get approximately 10,000 customers. So like data for all 10,000 customers is being written in one partition. And when you write this partition back to Postgres, it will still not ensure that all the rows for a particular customer are at one place. Like all the rows are written contiguously. And like Spark is uh, intelligent enough to understand that, OK, if you repartition it and the data uh, the, the shape of the data in a particular partition is not changing much. It will not shuffle your data too much amongst the RDDs, because that is an expensive operation for it as well. So that is what was happening, that each partition had a lot of customer, ID, customer IDs uh, information in it. And hence, when it was being written into, it did not really reflect uh, it being uh, written contiguously in a, in a particular block. So how do you really uh, bring all the rows for a particular customer ID together right, in a particular partition? Like any guesses anybody would like to make? I already uh, sort of showed you the answer, but yeah, any guesses that you would like to make at this point? Okay, okay. So uh, like doing the brute fa going the brute force way. Like uh, how about we sort them, right? Uh, how about I say key okay, uh, repartition it on it on customer ID, but also sort it on customer ID. So that should ensure that all the customer ID rows are at one place in a particular partition. Um, so Spark gives you this API called repartition and also sort within the partitions. Uh, so when you do this, uh, you can see that your uh, data frame now looks like this. Like in a particular partition, uh, 123 and 453, which were already there in this particular uh, data frame, in this particular partition earlier, will now be sorted on customer ID and you'll have the product IDs against it. So now, if I write this partition back to Postgres, uh, does it really align the data? Uh, so that is what the final test is for us. We wrote this data back to my database table and saw and looked at what is going to be my distribution. Okay. So yes, for sure, like all the rows for a particular customer ID, one, two, five, four, are now written in one block as like we wanted it to make my queries faster. And they are different places in that particular block. So this is really uh, uh, that moment for us, like, OK, now uh, everything is really working good for us. But that final test is still there, right? It's still not euphoric for us uh, till now. We still want my queries to be faster. So the final test is still there. We went back to our best friend, Explain Analyze, and uh, asked it, OK, hey, for customer ID 24001, tell me what is the query plan. So right now, it did a bitmap heap scan as, uh, against the uh, simple index scan that was, it was doing earlier. And now the execution time is under 3 ms. So that's a huge jump, right? From under, from like approximately 100 ms to 3 ms, that's a huge jump in latencies. So that is a really uh, good move. That was a really good moment for us. We have finally achieved what you wanted to. Uh, but you might uh, also ask at this point, like why a bitmap heap scan at this point? If the, uh, if the database engine had maybe chosen in a simple index scan, would that still be easy? Or maybe a bitmap heap scan earlier, would that have brought the execution times uh, down to 3ms at, as what is doing right now? So like why a bitmap scan is uh, a plain index scan. It just fetches the tuple pointer at a time from the index and immediately fetches that record from the table. So if you have something like 212, comma 95 and 213, comma 95, it fetches 212 first, then uh, brings it to memory, again goes to 213 and brings it to memory, and finally returns the results, all of them, back to my uh, application. But a bitmap heap scan, on the other hand, it fetches all the tuple pointers together, it uh, rearranges them, it sorts them according to the uh, position of the blocks that is there. Like, for example, if I had 212 and 215 here, um, it is arranging uh, all the 212 rows together, all the 215 rows together, and then fetching the records from memory. So in that uh, sense, a, bi a bitmap heap scan in this manner is only doing two passes on the disk. It is only visiting two blocks on the disk. If the bitmap heap scan was happening on the distribution, which was earlier, uh, it still has to visit all the different blocks and still has to uh, bring all of them into memory. Uh, so it will not save on the random access IO that was leading to latencies. So hence, uh, the, hence, here is where the DB engine really shines, right? It, it understands, OK, your distribution is now not spread across various blocks. So bitmap heap scan is where it will make the most sense here. So database engine in that way is intelligent enough to understand that. 
So yeah, the execution time came down from 100 ms to 3 ms for us. And yep, yeah, now the team is really happy because uh, bringing latencies, why is that important is like it has allowed us to serve various use cases. For example, if I wanted to send uh, bulk notifications of recommendations to my users, now it is possible for me to do it because the latencies to fetch a particular recommendation is, has gone down. And my API latencies have become really well, like they are under uh, 3 ms now. So that, has, that really helps us uh, scale these solutions really well. So that's all, that, that was all the talk was about. Um, so we are also hiring, like if you are interested in solving similar problems and you would like to join our team, uh, let's talk about it. Um, uh, you can always mail me at this particular email address and we can definitely take that forward from there. So yeah, that's all from my end. Uh, I'm happy to take questions in if they are. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, I did not get the question. So were you updating these values as well or you were, you know, uh, just inserting it sequentially? Because, just uh, what I feel like when you will update it, mm -hmm. it will be difficult to maintain the sequence, right? Okay, like just inserting and then updating that data. Okay, so in this case, uh, we are not updating the data. This is a batch-based job which runs once a day. Uh, it, uh, the Spark job runs once a day. It just fetches the recommendations and writes it. There are no updates happening on this particular table. So in that manner, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if updates can really change the distribution on the disk or not, but yeah, we can definitely check that. Yeah, because to maintain this, you know, rollback and all, and then uh, locking and around the row, uh, right. the CTID actually plays an important role, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, to make sure that it is in order, then you need to shuffle all the things down. Okay. That will be difficult, I feel, like, you know, uh, okay. to sure. maintain it all. Right? Sure, yeah. In that case, maybe this solution might not work. Yeah. Yeah. So, have you tried clustering your table? Uh, so, like clustering had, it con had its cons, like as I mentioned, that it required that I take a read-write lock on that table, uh, which was not what we could afford at you that can, time. You can do it with PG repack. PG? Repack as well. Repack. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Does it ensure that uh, I don't take a lock on the table? It, it will still take a lock. Okay. Okay. Because... Uh, but because it's, it's, a, it's a very short time lock. Achha. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's not like uh, for entire operation it, it won't lock your table. It's just a uh, minimal lock initially mm -hmm. when it creates a pointer mm -hmm. and then the uh, <coughs> remaining operation will online and right. then again when it writes back uh, the buffers and uh, <coughs> switches the pointer at that time it will take again. Okay. So okay. Okay. We might not be able to do that also because this application which fetches the recommendations is like 24-7. Uh, like if a lock happens for even for a minute or two, those APIs calls will start failing at that time. So that might also not be possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can do that also. Like with cluster, I can probably uh, create a temporary table, cluster it, and then write it back to the final table. Yeah, we can do that maybe. Yeah, right. There is, there is many, many scenarios when um, some queries are uh, running based on customer ID right. and some queries may be some dates in the same table. Right. In that case, when we when you do this type of ordering, the other side it will, will become right. uh, very worse. Right, right. That is true. Uh, this solution only worked because we had, a, uh, we had a very fixed sort of query that, okay, I only want recommendations on this particular customer ID. If, if uh, this would have been on any other key. This would definitely not work. In that uh, situation, like we would be going for maybe a solution which is not Postgres based, uh, a solution which probably caches the results and then fetches it. But uh, the biggest advantage that we had in this case that my query patterns were fixed. Yeah. Uh, anything else? Anybody else who wants to ask questions? Uh, hash index. I'm sorry, I didn't get your question. So, uh, in Postgres, you do get uh, hash indexes. 
right right so they have lot of problems with them mm -hmm. Uh, no, no, we, we didn't go for hash indexes. Um, we will, uh, so I'm not sure if hash indexes would actually help here because um, the hash index would still be doing what uh, the, the, the problem was at this point that uh, it was but doing a lot look of. Up, index lookup can be improved, right? Like just by looking so at the, the problem problems. here was not index lookup actually. The index lookup was fast, but when you actually went to the disk to fetch that data is where the problem mostly was. So even if I made the index look up faster, if I made the first two steps in the index retrieval faster, that third step would still be the bottleneck for me. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, which Postgres version were you using? But this was 9.6 plus. 9.6 plus, okay. So yeah, uh, in Postgres 10 and above, declarative hmm. partitioning is there, so maybe okay. Uh, okay. for if you if you plan to upgrade Postgres, maybe right. you can use declarative partitioning. Sure. Where you can do rehash based partitioning also, so you mm -hmm. can create different partitions uh, mm -hmm. for a range of customers, and right. Postgres automatically uh, arranges them in the blocks. Sure. sure. Uh, as you. Yeah. yeah. So that 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 is something which we had uh, thought of doing if this particular approach did not work. So and if my table size is increasing, for for example, right now this is about 32 GBs in size. If it went beyond that, we definitely would want partition that data on customer ID for sure. Do we have any more questions? Thank you. Thanks, okay. Apurva. Thank you so much for coming.